Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And there's a number of reasons for that. One is that the, the temperature difference is around 20 degrees Celsius today. So uh, uh, it's much better to be here and, and, and do something. It's a good place also for hiding and doing some real work, probably doing management or something. So when Eva and I discussed about what we want to discuss, what we want to talk here about, I thought, well, how about sustainability? Everybody's talking about sustainability. And the truth is nobody really has a good definition of what it is. Everybody means something else. So I'll take the liberty and, and show you what I believe with sustainability. And I'm, as a supercomputing center, I want to give you an idea on what, what it means for energy consumption. And there is one tweet in there also, which is HPC and AI. So when we talk about AI, there was a statement recently, if we want to build all the AI infrastructures that people demand at the moment, there wouldn't be enough electricity on the planet to feed that. And I think one of the reasons there is that uh, AI is very much at the time where HPC was 20 years ago. So there's some time to catch up and I want to show you a couple of things. And of course, this does not uh, work without the help of many others. So my team is doing great work here and they provided all the contents I have. So when we talk about energy, uh, the starting point is usual for me to get a feeling for what we are talking here about. How much electro electrical power do we actually need for all this digital stuff? And I'm starting with my very old iPhone 8. So I'm a very conservative person, never change your running system, it still works. So that's why I'm using it. And I was wondering how much energy do I need? And the interesting number here is, of course, this is all Euro, but if you take a one-to-one -one conversion, then you're almost there. So approximately with one charge per day, I need about one Euro or one dollar per year in electricity. So I can afford this phone. This is, this is possible, yeah? Even with the government salary. Uh, the other point, if you go bigger, is you talk about the personal computer, just any of today, you'd say uh, you're using it for four hours, you come about 200 kilowatt hours per year, which is about 60 euro per year. Huh? Also something which is reasonable in our sense. Interesting, there was another paper uh, estimating the carbon footprint of a personal computer running 24 hours a day. Well, and that was more than an SUV. So if you drive an SUV, just shut down your PC sometimes and you're all fine with the carbon footprint, okay? Now talking about cars, how about all these fancy cars here on the streets? How much is a Tesla actually? And of course we have to compare, this is for European, uh, uh, how to say, petrol fuel pricing, yeah? So if you put this all together, then uh, we come up with an electricity price of 800 euro per year for the average uh, model S60 and about 15,000 kilometers uh, that you're driving. Again, convert that to, to your own currency. Of course, electricity is a little bit cheaper. Uh, I mean, in, 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 in Germany, the electricity price that I'm paying at the cent is about 20, 20 cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, Berlin is paying about 68 cent per kilowatt hour. So there's a bit of a range in between there. Yeah? So, uh, Taking this as, as granted, what are we doing? Now, the Leibniz Supercomputing Center is the building that you see here. It's actually all these five buildings. So you enter from the right-hand side, then you have these two institute buildings. You see, we also have some uh, plants up here. That's it's very modern. Here, we want to put up some solar panels, which is an entirely different story. Uh, and there is a small visualization cube. There is an, a, a, a conference center kind of say. And we have about 300, uh, oh, it's actually 304 staff members at the moment. So that's the people working. And the interesting part is in this section. So that's where we have the twin cube, uh, which has about uh, 115,000 square feet on five floors. And uh, the interesting thing is that you need about two thirds of the volume to run one third. This is where the computers are. And that's what people always un underestimate. And one of these blocks on the roof here, that's interesting for electricity because that's the cooling towers. One of these blocks cools about 2.2 megawatts. And in total, we can go up to 10 megawatts at the moment. We're using on average around six megawatts. And just again, to give you a number, that means per hour, we need uh, about 1,500 to 2,000 euros in electricity costs per hour, which means uh, two days or three days, you have the annual salary of a PhD student or 120 PhD students per year, which we're just putting into electricity. 
So electricity is an issue here which we need to get under control. And we're doing this since we are providing services since 1962 for the Munich universities, for the state of Bavaria, for Germany, and some things we're also providing for Europe. So there's a quite diverse kind of set of users which are benefiting from that and which kind of want to use these things that we are doing. Now, uh, as Eva has been saying, we are part of the Bavarian Academy of Science and the Humanities, so we also have a research focus, which means about one third of the people are not doing services only, but are providing research. And the research in our case also does not, should not be in, in, in competition with the universities. So we found our own research field, which is more or less making services work. So the idea is really, how do you do IT services? What research can you do in, in making these things work? And you will see some of these things, which are results of the research we are, what we are doing, and which then feed back into what uh, the center is actually running for the users. Now we talked about what, the, what we're doing for the users. And here's a couple of things. This is actually the world's largest turbulence simulation, which means nobody ever has done a bigger turbulence simulation even so there are bigger systems, but this was really highly optimized at the point being uh, for our particular system. And what we are seeing is, is more or less, we take a cube out of the universe uh, shortly after the Big Bang. So there was only clouds, of gases and all these things. So we take this cube and the, the sine length is 10,080 uh, elements in three dimensions. And we are simulating the behavior of the, of the gas clouds in there and how stars are born, so how a concrete ma mass is born out of all these turbulence in the gas flows. That's what we see here in this video, also a little bit here. And this 10,080 by 10,080 by 10,080 is the maximum we can simulate on the entire system. And we are running out of memory, running out of compute power, these things. So that's really one of these things that we are doing. That's a typical application of our users because there's many astrophysicists also around the area that we are working on. Now, the question is always, what do you as, and me as a person get from that? It's a nice story when you are out for dinner with somebody lovely and you want to explain oh, how these stars were born, you can get all through the formula. Of course, it's a little bit far-fetched, so to say. But if we take the next example, we will see exactly the same lattice Boltzmann equations on, on something different. So it's, it's again the same simulation kind of mathematics in between the algorithm here. And what we see here is the blood stream in the circle of Willis, which is the area uh, of the arterial tree in, in your brain. Uh, it's the same simulation. Again, this little simulation requires a number of thousand uh, cores to just do this computation to give you a, a near real uh, kind of version of what the blood is doing in your cells. So this is for a project on a digital twin of a patient where we are trying to simulate, simulate the entire patient and we have far from enough uh, uh, computational power to really get to the, what, what we need for a full person. So that's another example. And I have a third example where we also see how, how supercomputing kind of affects what we are doing in, in, in real life. So on the, on the right hand side, you see a picture uh, of the last flooding in Germany, which is a couple of years ago. Uh, we also chose this picture because we know that uh, the, the truck driver and the second truck was a good friend of our former minister. So it always shows up nicely on political pictures. <laughs> and the question here was also, how can we help these people with their, their application? So what we see in the left-hand side is a visualization in our five-sided cave, which shows us the effects of climate change on really regional areas. So what does it mean with the climate change for Bavaria, for the state of Bavaria, for smaller regions than the entire planet where we're talking average temperatures? Yeah? And what we see here is very sim interestingly enough, we, we compare it to the last flooding, major flooding in, in, in Bavaria, and we see how future floodings are probably looking like with all the changes that we are seeing. The problem is this is really a horror movie because we see that everything we've seen in flooding so far is nothing compared to what is waiting for us around the corner, which also again kind of gives us some indication of what we need to do here. The point here is of course that uh, these are more and more applications of what we see in climate change. So we're taking this down to small areas. This is the state of Bavaria and you even so we go to the individual district, the individual political districts and try to sit it. 
That's a project by Ralph Ludwig. And uh, he's using the system to really find out how that works. And the results are, as I was saying, uh, we see this also here on this uh, slide, the change in intensity of the HF100, which is the 100 year flooding. So we had the probability that they appear every 100 years. And the bad thing is you see they're going down to red here, which means we will see 100 year flooding uh, with a, within an interval of 20 to 40 years. So we will have much more floodings. I could show you the same kind of, uh, also kind of slide for, for droughts and all the other things. So this is just if we assume the current increase of uh, climate change as we see it. And the results of this is also not only scientific, but this is actually something that was contributed to the IPCC, IPCC report. So in these two reports from 21 and 22, the results of our simulations came in and really kind of uh, uh, indicated the increases in frequency and tendency of these hot extremes and the effectiveness of the adaptation once we know what is going to happen, what we're seeing there. So we have some good examples. Uh, and of course, all these examples are using our system, which is our current leadership class system, uh, which is Super MOOC NG, currently the second fastest in Germany. Uh, so we have number two and number four. I'll show you number four in, the, in a second. And that system is interesting because when we bought it, uh, uh, we, we were expecting a system with GPUs and, and, and a good mixture between C, C, CPUs and GPUs. This system doesn't have any GPUs in there. So it's really a pure CPU system because the results we got from this system were much better than from a system where we had uh, a combination of these things. And that's how we are driving the system. So as I'm always saying, I don't care about the position in the top 500. What I care about is the best system for science, which is what we have here. And here comes also your work in there. Yeah, Because of course the users need GPUs eventually to do their machine learning or AI stuff or whatever, but they were using it on a cloud that was kind of the front end to this system. So we have a cloud where you configure your virtual machine and from there you submit the job to the big system. So there was a workflow in there on how these things are connected, how they play together. The system is also kind of uh, easy to use because it's really x86 system, so any code can run there. And that is also shown with the number of, of codes that we have in here. So we are running 515 different projects from about 1,400 scientists. And they really kind of like the system because it's just taking your code, putting it there, scaling it up and, and, and using the system. Uh, now, I was already mentioning that uh, top 500 is not important. So this is when it was published on the top 500. So we managed to get to position eight. And again, I'm, it's a recorded, so I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> but in, in fact, what we ask our government is whether you want to be in the top five, what are your expectations? Government said top 10. So when we ended up at eight, we stopped the benchmarking. Yeah, I said, because we knew that this is sufficient. The system has a potential to be up at five Yeah, at that point in time. So we know it was good enough to go higher, but it was not our intention. So we're using Linpack more or less to test the infrastructure not to compete in some Formula One race or something, or NASCAR, I should say, over here. Yeah? So, uh, of course, that also means we have an evolution. So this is the latest extension to the system, and that's actually a GPU extension. So we're really kind of building phase two up here with, uh, it says 240 uh, nodes each with four uh, uh, GPUs, with Montevecchio GPUs from Intel. So we have about 960 GPUs, which are now contributing again uh, with the other system. And again, in reality, it's a workflow. It's just that we are putting these things closer together because uh, there is an issue with uh, how you want to move the data, how you would to want to put these things together. So what is the problem with this system if we're taking a look into the future? And I think the problem is very nicely articulated on this slide. The slide shows us the power consumption over time for the top 500 entries. And we see there's a slight increase if we just take the, 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 the position 500, there is an, a good increase already if you have a top 50 system, but there's a substantial increase if you're talking about top 10. So the only possibility at this point in time to get more performance out of the system is to put more electricity in. And I'm not sure if that is a sustainable approach. So th that, that is an, an, a, a real difficulty here. But for us, it means we need to take this seriously. And not only because of 
the, the carbon footprint that we are generating, it's also a financial aspect. Yeah? The more we are spending on electricity, the less we get out of computational power. So when we buy these systems, the question is always, we have a fixed amount of money and you need to get a system with a performance in and the remainder of the money must fit for the electricity costs that you have. So it's really an interesting challenge for the for the for the so vendors. You should buy your own power plant. Well, <laughs> I'll get to that in a sec. <laughs> We're actually putting up a, a new power station there for the next uh, upgrade in, in terms of electricity. But again, is this really where we want to go? And again, if I go back to my first statement, AI is exactly in that problem putting these things in. Now, what we have been doing is we were thinking about computational performance and energy together in terms of energy efficiency. And we have tried a couple of things here. So in 2012, we had the first world's first hot water cooled system where hot water was cooling CPU memory. Hot water means we have inlet temperatures high enough so that we can use free cooling, which means the inlet temperature must be higher than uh, what is outside because we go in with a certain inlet temperature, which is 45 degrees Celsius, which should be around 110 Fahrenheit, if I remember correctly. And we're coming out with a higher uh, temperature water, and we need to get back down to the inlet temperature. And that's all done with the outside air. So it means we don't need any extra energy for cooling the system. We're just making sure that the system can also live with hotter temperatures. So at that point in time, interesting story, we had the, the uh, at that time, CEO of IBM visiting, they were the winning window, so to say, and, and Gini Rometty said, nobody needs that. The Americans have all the chillers outside, who would need a hot water cool system, yeah? So it was really something where, where IBM was not convinced, we were lucky because we had the IBM Research Center in, uh, bless you, we had the IBM Research Center in Böblingen, and uh, they said, this is an interesting project, let's do it. Yeah? If you take a look at today's system, there's many hot water cooled systems. Yeah? But the difference is that most of these systems go up to 20, 25 degrees Celsius. We are now at 45 degrees Celsius, which means we can really run throughout the year without additional cooling and, and, and doing that. So that's what I was mentioned here. And that means the power usage effectiveness is 1.03. And that's a number we will see in a second again. One means this is what we need the power for running the system for doing the computation. And what's behind the comma is what we need for cooling the system. So in that sense, we need 3% extra energy to cool the system, which is exactly what we need in terms to run all the, the pumps in order to get uh, the hot water to the roof, wait long enough, and then use it again for cooling the system. Yeah? And that's a pretty good number, I believe. Is there anybody better? I, I, I haven't met one so far, but it might be, you know? It's hard to imagine. Yeah, and I'll, I'll well, we even improve on that one. I'll give you, a, I'll come to that in a second. So for the current procurement, we are trying to do the same thing. The problem is we have to increase the number of components which can be hot water cooled. Yeah, we started with CPU memory. Of course, then we want a little bit further. And now they are, the question is, can we do that same with, with GPUs? And I can already say, yes, we can but I'll, I'll show you in a second. There's even more things that we want to do. I said we are doing a holistic approach. Yeah? If we take the green 500 and most other things, what they are doing is, is mostly kind of thinking about the HPC system hardware and maybe a little bit about the HPC system software. We are thinking from the time where the electricity comes into the building and where the heat leaves the building on the other side, which means we are also talking about the building infrastructure and the HPC applications. So you can make your application better in terms of carbon footprint, which is what many people underestimate. So can we kind of improve what we are running on these systems? And I believe we should even make it an incentive for the users to have a better code in order to kind of produce a large, uh, smaller carbon footprint. So for us, this is not just kind of a running system. This is also an experimental field where we are optimizing the computing center on the fly and actually rebuilding also the inside infrastructure while the system is, is running and operating. So uh, what we are kind of putting together is this holistic optimization strategy. And that goes a little bit further. So we're using things like dynamic voltage frequency scaling. Yeah? Do we really need to run the processes at full speed all the time? So if I take a look at your laptops, none of them, or they're mostly not running full time, but they are scaling down because they don't need it. They want to keep longer batteries. 
We are doing the same system here. Superbook NG is usually running with 68% of the uh, nominal uh, frequency. So we're really going down, kind of depending on how many memory accesses you have, what is the distance between them, and how you can optimize this. We also have things of like power capping and sleep uh, modes that we are using extensively during the system. So in fact, we also have to balance in terms of the energy price to be within a certain band. And towards the end of the year, we're really optimizing to be exactly in there in order to pay less than when you're speeding up or down in both directions. And that is possible because we can also control the system regulated with the, uh, uh, with, with the power income. We're using 100% renewable energy since uh, 2012. So that's when we kind of started with that one. Uh, we are kind of doing things like uh, cooling infrastructure optimization. So we also got rid of the glycol, uh, which you usually need in Germany because it's freezing in winter. But we figured out, okay, you have warm water flowing around there. And as long as warm water is flowing, there's no freezing. Yeah? So what we invented here was simplified just an emergency exit if the water flow stops or something. And that allows us to run glucose free. And then again, with our water without glucose is much better as an uh, energy, uh, as, a, as a heat transporter. Uh, we are trying to use the waste heat. I'll have uh, two slides on that one. We are doing things like adsorption cooling machines, which I also have a slide on to show you later. And of course, there's other things which I'm not touching today, like other accelerators, like we have a Cerebus WS2 with, uh, at the moment, three quantum uh, computers already. And we believe quantum not as a standalone system, but again, as an accelerator, which might be more energy efficient than other things that we have on the system. And that puts all these things together. So these are research topics which we're doing at the center, which also comes from the left-hand side with all these things that we are kind of putting into real operation. And on the right-hand side, the DCDB, the data center database, which collects the information from all the sensors and puts it together. So I think for HPC, we have a very good plan. We have been doing this for more than 10 years. And I think uh, other centers are uh, equally well suited for that. Now, how, what about chat GPT now? Let's, let's go to the other side. How about AI? And of course, there's a question, is ChatGPT energy efficient? And since it's ChatGPT, you just, everybody does that, ask ChatGPT. So we ask ChatGPT and the answer from ChatGPT is, okay, there's kind of dependency on what you're actually doing. What is the hardware, the model size deployment? These models could be energy efficient. And of course, there's also a question on the infrastructure topic here. Yeah? So there is an aspect here where ChatGPT tells the truth, but it doesn't give you a real number. Okay, so can we also see what is the energy consumption for training ChatGPT? And again, it gives you a politically answer. Yeah, it didn't give you correct numbers, but it gives you something. Okay, there could be some high energy usage here, uh, with GPT three being 175 billion parameters and uh, hundreds of megawatt hours of electricity. Okay, that number rings already. If you remember, we have a maximum of 10 megawatt input into the center. So there's also some more kind of uh, things that you can find online. If you take a look at ChatGPT3 uh, energy consumption, then uh, the model, just to train the model, is 1,064 megawatt hours. Uh, if you kind of operate search requests, and that was the old the GPT-3 model, is 260 megawatt hours per day. Now, why not compare this to the world's fastest computer frontier? Huh? and see how Frontier compares to that. And we all know Frontier, of course. And we know it takes about 22.7 megawatts according to the top 500. And so in total, Frontier goes up to 545 megawatt hours per day. So you need quite a substantial power for ChatGPT for training, and you need half the electricity of Frontier for every day just to process the search requests, yeah? Which means, we are really feeding the monster here in our background, yeah? So to, to say that nicely. Of course, there are optimization. That's always a snapshot in time. But if you just compare a chat GPT query, just one question that you put in there, it's 6.79 watt hours compared to what we had for our iPhone 8 in the beginning. Uh, and if you compare the same query to Google, it's 0 0.3 watt hours, yeah? So if you ask the same question, both sides, you're spending 20 times more electricity with ChatGPT. So next time you use ChatGPT, think about whether Google would also give you 
a kind of maybe uh, uh, same answer. Now, if you put these all together, we did some some more math here. Of course, uh, you have these ideas. So the 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 operate the search requests for every day, and that's the last uh, bullet point here, corresponds to the power consumption of a small town with two hundred twenty four thousand households or sixty four thousand inhabitants. Of course, in Germany, uh, so there might be differences here, but still, it's substantial what we are just putting in for for simple things like search requests. Now, can we also take this a little bit further again and see how does uh, ChatGPT compare to the top 500 supercomputers? And I took the list from 2023. Uh, and of course, you can choose just window NVIDIA and you get out 16 entries in the top 500. And of course, this number is increasing. So these are just the top five uh, entries uh, in the top 500, which are NVIDIA built systems. And you see here uh, on position nine, an NVIDIA system with the A100, so that's also the old GPUs here, but it's number of cores and there is a certain power consumption already for these cores up there. Yeah? And if we take a look at all these systems, we notice a couple of things and characteristics here. Now, all these systems are built with uh, uh, kind of components that you can buy from NVIDIA called the DGX A100, which looks like this one. And you see these blocks are in here. Yeah? And interestingly enough, you see in each of these racks is four of the blocks, yeah? We'll get to that in a second. But in essence, each of these blocks has about eight GPUs, yeah? So in, what, what I get here is four times eight, 32 GPUs in, in, in one block from what we call an e NVIDIA DGX SuperPod. Uh, and of course, that was done in a hurry, so they had to put it together so they could only do it air-cooled, yeah? Because if you put something up, you don't have the infrastructure, you have to do it this way. Water cooling is mentioned in some of these systems. I think only two or three, uh, but they're using kind of water cooling as a supplement, uh, rear, do, uh, rear door heat exchanges. The power usage effectiveness here of these systems, of the air cooled system, is between 1.65 and 1.80, <coughs> which means we're using again 100% for the computation, but we are adding 65 to 80% for the air cooling. And that's ridiculous, in my opinion. Yeah? Because it does not only mean that we're kind of going in there with what we need anyway for the computation, but we almost need the same amount uh, for just cooling these systems. Yeah? And if you stand in front of one of these systems, well, you can use it as a hairdryer more or less. Yeah, that's exactly what they're, 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 they're useful. And you can feel even how many users are on the system. That's interesting when you, when you do the tour and, and, and you see what the, the users are in there. So. What we did is, of course, uh, so that's how it gets together. So the, the power usage effectiveness is about 30% is added for the fans in the system, and about 30% is also added from the cooling infrastructure in the house. So we had to do the same thing here. Users came and said, we want to do that. So can we put that together? So here you see our system, which is interesting in essence, because we are doing it water cooled direct. So there's a heat uh, exchanger here with, with cold water, and we have the same blocks up here. And you see three here and you see two here, which means uh, we cannot fit more than three in here because the capacity, the cooling capacity of our racks today just does not allow. So each of them has about eight kilowatts and we get about uh, uh, 24 kilowatts uh, cooling capacity per rack. Yeah? So that's the maximum. We are also wasting this, this space. And if you remember the previous pictures, we had only 40 in there. So they have better air cooling, but they still cannot use the space. Actually, if I take a look at the racks, that's why we pictured them from the background, about half of it is just the fans that, that you need to cool the system, yeah? So you're really kind of wasting some space in there and how, how this is done. Which, as I said again, if you need it rapidly, that's the thing you want to do. If you have only one, then you may be able to just put it somewhere, yeah? But once you exceed that, it gets a bit of a problem. And here again, the story that I mentioned. So we went to water cooling uh, because of this slide here. It shows us a comparison between what you get out in terms of air cooling, water cooling, and the factor is the important thing. Here. How much better is water cooling than air cooling? Yeah. And the smallest number is here is four times, uh, but there are bigger numbers depending on what you're kind of measuring in terms of capacity here. So water cooling is much better in a sense. And we were thinking about, I mean, we knew that from HPC, so we built our system this way. So the first thing you have in there is all these water connectors. Then comes the racks, and you put that in. 
And of course, the difference is you put on each of the boards, you have to put the water inlets, and of course, you have to go as close as possible to the components you want to cool with the water. And there is some, the, the racks look a little bit different from the background. Question here is always how many leakage did you have? And I can tell we had two. Yeah? And the reason for this leakage is also interesting because it's these connectors in the back. And these connectors is the same what you might have at home in your garden. You know, the garden hose is connected somehow. And just try an experiment, connect it once a year and let it lie for a year. Yeah? And in, in, when you do this in spring, then in, in, in autumn, you will have leakage there yeah? because water finds a way. So the solution to get rid of the leakage was really to disconnect each of the rigs uh, every six months. And since then, we didn't have a leakage anymore because it's just that these connectors kind of give you that issue. And it was not a problem, it's just physics from water. There's some more things needed here, and don't go into details. The important factor is here is 3,000 liters of water per hour per rack, which is quite what you want to, uh, it's quite an amount you want to get to. And there is some kind of reduction in terms of, of uh, energy that you need for these systems. Yeah? The important point here is what does that mean in euros or dollars? Yeah? And SuperMOOC NG was, costs uh, 96 million euros. Uh, the reduction that we make here is 12 million euros for the runtime of the system. So we are saving 2 million euros per year, which is good money, which means we have 12 million euros extra, which we can spend on a larger system and do more science with it. So energy efficiency in that sense is not really only about making sure we have a reduced carbon footprint, but it's also kind of making sure that we're saving money because we want to do more science. And I think that's also one of the questions. You, you want to be energy efficient because you're saving money, which is, I don't hear that from politicians, yeah? So that, that, that's one of the things I think that we're missing here in the story. And that comes in a second more. So in fact, what, what I have here for you is this is the old sets and this is the new racks. This is what Lenovo in that case built for us. We're also discussing with the other vendors. And what we see here with the NVIDIA DGX is more or less two of these uh, uh, slots, two of these nodes. It's the equivalent of what we see here with, with one of the NVIDIA boxes. Yeah? Difference is also that these racks are 100% hot water cooled. So we really kind of have here a system where we can fit 144 GPUs in one rack. Yeah? So if somebody tells me, put up 1,000 GPUs, then I need about 40 racks with this kind of installation, which is about half of what SuperMOOC NG is, and I need about seven racks with what we do here. So 1,000 GPUs is less than from the wall to here uh, in terms of computational power. And that's, again, something where we need to kind of make sure that we understand that. Yeah? Now, the question is here, of course, we mentioned the PoE here, 1.65 to 1.8. So if we do this 100% uh, hot water cooled, uh, what does that mean? Well, in fact, we get to a, we were estimating a PoE again of 1.03 to 1.05, and the interesting thing is we measured 1.02, so we were even kind of getting down there because the new components and new integration is much better in terms of what we are doing here. Again, this was measured for the A100. We now have it with the H100, so it's the same story here, uh, and and we are reducing the power intake. Uh, by almost 60%, more than 60% of what we need here. Again, which comes back to euros and dollars. Yeah? It's, it, it's, it's, it's a very simple calculation in that sense. There is, of course, a lower uh, footprint. Yeah? But if somebody, again, asked me, put up 1,000 GPUs or 2,000 GPUs, I mean, I, more or less, I don't need that much space for that. Yeah? And that's what we are discussing. That's my call with the ministry today was exactly... What we're doing, and I said, we just, I mean, we can just put it in the corner of the building somewhere, yeah, for that sense. The other interesting thing here is, of course, there's no fans in there. These systems are completely silent. You don't hear anything, yeah. It's just you stand next to them and you're not sure are they turned on or you have to go in and see some of the lights burning. Otherwise, you don't see that they are, they are turned on. So that's an interesting thing. And that's where we see how AI is benefiting from what we did in HPC. It goes even further. I showed you the other thing with, with, with uh, dynamic frequency scaling, yeah? Or uh, with the optimization of the scheduler, yeah? Most of the IR people today use their interactive tools. 
that works nice if you work on small models yeah but when you have bigger models you have to do a batch scheduler and suddenly we see all these big ai people moving to slurm and we've been using slurm for quite some time and our slurm has also this energy efficiency optimization so we can really benefit from kind of making these things that we did in HPC available for the last couple of years, just giving that to them. Now, most people now say, well, okay, there's a problem. Hot water is so expensive just to put all these infrastructures in there. And I said, well, we didn't want to do it that way. We're also kind of research focused. We had to do it anyway. Yeah? So for us, it was a thing. And I mentioned the 12 million that we have been saving on the system. Now, what about you make a brand new computing center and you start fresh today? And there's a good example for that one. That's particularly a system which I had nothing to do with that. That's the Helmut Schmidt University in Hamburg. And they bought from a company called Macware uh, a, a, a cluster which is hot water cool. Macware is a small kind of uh, computer company which has a number of systems on the top 500, just not the top ranked system, but the average car, and they were competing with other vendors for this contract. And they won against the others who had air-cooled system with the hot water-cooled system. Why? Because over the time and all this development recently, we are now at a point where the hot water cooling is actually uh, really something where you have kind of a competitive advantage, so to say. Of course, if you take in terms of investment, the IT is slightly more expensive because you have to hook up the water cooling on top of it. But over time, of course, the price goes down. You have the power consumption. You have less. You need less power, so you need uh, less uh, dollars for that. If you take the the chillers, you also require fewer chillers. So on average, you require one seventh of the chillers you need for air cooling, yeah? which is also already an investment. It's cheaper. And then over the operation, again, the power consumption goes down and you need the, the chillers cut out. So this is really something that shows that hot water cooling is competitive. In that sense, what they had, they had just a concrete floor and they had just a power connector and a water connector and that's it. Everything else was delivered in containers that just put it up there and they have a system that is hot water cooled and cooled by the outside air. Now I was mentioning the outside air what I'm doing with the hot water, and that is an interesting. So since 2012, we're producing this hot air. And unfortunately, until two years ago, uh, sending the hot air over garping, the air over garping was, was, was cheaper than, uh, was more expensive than the gas we got from a certain Mr. Putin. Yeah? So it was really kind of a strange situation because we couldn't even give away the heat. Even if I would have given the heat to the neighboring institutes, somebody would have to pay taxes because we are different organizations. There's a trade. So somebody said, we want to give, give it to them for free, for nothing. Yeah? And uh, it was not possible at that point in time for a number of regulatory issues. Yeah? And then two years ago, the situation changed. And now we are really implementing that we are heating the surrounding areas. And again, I mean, for heating, we are heating our system to 100%, yeah? which means uh, when we had the, the energy crisis in Europe, we got this letter from the government, how much heating costs do we have? And we added zero and send it back. They called us, it cannot be, why do you have zero? In our case, the computer is heating the entire building. Yeah? In fact, the computer is only, we require only 0.5% of the heat that the system is dissipating. Yeah? So it really kind of is, so we, which means in essence, we could heat 200 of the buildings we have, yeah? or 40,000 households again around the area there. So this is moving, but the problem is we also had to think about what else could we do with the heat. Yeah? One of the things was also, we wanted to do a greenhouse. Yeah? And I told you it's colder down there. So we said, if we build a greenhouse, we could have bananas all year or oranges would be another option. Yeah. So uh, greenhouse is also a difficult thing. Again, in Germany, there's many regulations. You cannot just build fruits, yeah? Uh, do your own fruits. You have to have all these. So the greenhouse didn't work out. Beer was the other option for Bavaria, yeah? <laughs> Problem is we're getting out with 65 degrees Celsius outlet temperature and beer, you need 75, yeah? So again, just a little bit missing here. And we're hoping, we want to go up with the temperatures in order to do our own beer. Okay. So, but what we did is, and here's the story about the adsorption chilling, and that's again a research story. 
So what we see here is adsorption chillers. This is actually version two. Version one was about one of these blocks half size. And this is uh, version three in operation. Yeah? And this works like the fridge at home. Remember your fridge at home produces cold air inside the fridge by heating up uh, on the backside and, and making sure that you have this cold air production. Yeah? Now we have this system that is heating up. Yeah? So what we do is we use the heat from NG, from SuperMook, put it into the system and generate cold, uh, cold water on the other side. Yeah? And we're actually cooling the cold water, the old cold water system with the waste heat from SuperMook NG, which is an interesting effect. There are some effi uh, um, efficiency issues here, yeah? but it's still, it's a research project. So why we wanted to do it. And if you see that this is almost the entire length of the building, so that's almost 72 meters that we have there in terms of, of, of infrastructure. Uh, and we need about one third to feed it uh, with the waste heat. So there's again, two thirds left that you could do other things with it. So we can heat and, and, and produce coal. So that's an interesting uh, project again, and uh, a research project. Now talking about others, what are others doing? Of course, there's also a problem with the water. Now the water in our sense is a closed circle. We don't want to kind of give water back. And we don't want to take too much water from the ground level. In fact, if we would give the water back to the to the neighboring river, then the fish would die because it would be too warm for them. Yeah, maybe the tourists would like it to go swimming, but it's not so good for the fish. Yeah, so we are really keeping it, and we're just replacing the little bit of water that is kind of uh, dissipated through the roof. Now, if you take a look at other things, this is the Google plant in Luxembourg. They need about ten million liters of water per day, and it's flowing water in the sense. Yeah. So Google also refuses to keep some details because it, it would show some internals. But of course, the problem is this is already 12% of the entire country's demand going into one uh, kind of uh, plant. And then again, if we're growing up, that, that, that shows around. You see also how much water they need inside. Now, there is an issue there. And the issue is also, I mean, this is an old article from uh, Nature that was taking a look at that one. And the old article was also predicting what we are seeing today. We see this immense increase in requirements for computation power. And this slide goes even up without the idea what AI is bringing in. Yeah? So this, this hockey stick is going really kind of exploding here at the moment. And I really have some serious doubts or issues if, if we can really go with all the way. I mean, good for NVIDIA making good business here. And I'm happy for them in a sense. But I'm not sure if, if we have really thought about the, the, the consequences of that. And if you see China going uh, underwater with, with uh, megawatts or gigawatts of, of AI capabilities, uh, yeah, somebody has to produce that electricity. And, 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 and there's a point to, do we really need that to ask the next recipe from JGT or something? Yeah? OK, so this is the, the point, I think, where we need to be active as a community and do something. Now, that brings me to. To the end or almost yeah so i hope i was able to give you some idea that energy efficiency is an essential criteria and we in our business so to say if, if i may say business yeah but we are responsible there of course we are also on the good side yeah because we are working in order to make sure that we, we kind of get climate change under control yeah but if i think of other situations yeah where we just think of entertainment and just compare what goes into entertainment and both goes into research, there's also a disbalance here. Yeah? So I'm, I'm not feeling bad, so to say. This is my own excuse. Uh, there is the other point. We don't, uh, gigaflop per watt is outdated. Yeah? We really need to take everything into account. Yeah? And I've discussed with the people from Green 500. I think it's a good start, the Green 500, but it's, we need to do more in that essence. Yeah? And my take on was always, it's not just that we discuss carbon footprint. Nobody has an idea of carbon footprint. I mean, you can go from here to, I don't know, Santa Clara and see what's the carbon footprint you do with your car. But that gives you a number that you have no feeling for. But if we tell how much we kind of spend in terms of, electric, uh, of, of monetary value on all these uh, climate issues, I think the story gets entirely different. And that's my approach that we are trying to, to feed here. Now, I'm also... I'm also I have one more slide, uh, which, which I just want to show as, as a little bit of, of, of an interesting thing, because one thing we do in our democratic world, and I'm again uh, 
hitting them at some other countries is we can sp speak freely and tell them what's nonsense, what we believe is nonsense. Yeah. So the German government proposed to build on energy efficiency for data centers. And in principle, that's a good idea. And I was asking the interview, what do you think about this new energy efficiency bill? I said, it's a great idea that the government is thinking about that. Yeah. But there are some, some problems here. And that was my second sentence. I said, everything the government is proposing is way too less ambitious because everything the government is proposing, we did more than 10 years ago. Yeah? So there's some couple of things here, like they are asking for a power usage effectiveness for new centers, lower or equal 1.3. Yeah? I think I showed you my numbers. So this is something, okay, that's okay for us. They want to use reused energy of at least 30% and then up to 40%, yeah? And we're running 100% renewable, yeah? So why not, yeah? And so on. And there's also these, they are still sticking on air cooling, yeah? which is something which I really don't understand, yeah? Well, I understand if I think about all the lobbying, uh, all the lobbyists are taking care here, but from a scientific standpoint, uh, it's one of the things where I have some, my criticism and where I think, uh, we've already shown it's better. Of course, I have a privileged position. We are academia. We can do things that are probably not possible elsewhere. Yeah? But I think at least some of the things we are doing could also feed into what is outside and which is why I've shown you the, the Helmut Schmidt University system. And with that, I hope you took the message. Let us work together on reducing the footprint for the wonderful tools that we are working with every day. Thanks a lot. Questions uh, for Dieter from the room or from Zoom? The last one. So, is there, um, is there any incentive to do time shifting? Like, do you have times when power is cheaper? Right now, for us, no. We, are, we actually, when we have a contract where we could buy, pay, pay um, could get power from the electricity grid on 15 minute intervals. Yeah? We're not doing that. We, we used to do that with one week in advance. So we knew next week we're going in maintenance, so we need less, so we can sell some of the electricity there. Next week we're going up in a sense. Yeah? So we, we are following the curves, so to say. But again, Mr. Putin going crazy meant that we had to get the electricity for running the system. So we have more or less a stable kind of source for the next two years. I think that that's coming back. And once we have these ideas, you would want to go power shifting also, depending on what the renewables are giving you, huh? right. in a sense. Is there sun, is there, I mean, we don't have that much sun as you have here. Right, so, but, but would, uh, if that was the case though, what would you do? I mean, would you? Yeah. Well, the simple answer is I could just reduce the clock frequency uh, up and down, yeah, which is as, we're doing that to optimize our bill in a sense, yeah? But we could also do this depending on the outside criteria. We're also using the system. Another thing we're doing is we're using the system to fill it up with jobs which are not critical, so to say. And again, this is recorded, so don't tell anybody. Uh, high energy physics, yeah? Right. The CERN experiments. There's enough small enough jobs which you can just stick in. If there is something available, you need to use the power. If not, you just drop them and do them some other time. Yeah. And that's where you have ways of balancing across these domains. I mean, I don't know enough about it. I've seen other centers have tanks where they basically show nighttime and the yeah. store, store the, the, the shoot water and then use the daytime. But you don't have anything like that. No, you don't have anything. anything. And, and that's the good thing is we don't need that because it, again the area is much more. Uh, crowded, so uh, we don't have the big chillers outside uh, as uh, others do. And, uh, and the second question is so you're not located on the campus? You, you we are located there. on the campus. Do you have other infrastructure on campus, like shield water and other, like when you say what they do with the hot water? Like on the campus, that seems like they already have yeah. infrastructure for that. <laughs> That's what you would think about. The problem is the campus, the Technical University of Munich, mm -hmm. and we are the Bavarian Academy of Sciences and Humanities. So it's two different organizations. So again, giving something for free doesn't work due to German law. And I talked to the finance ministry about that. I said, this is nonsense, yeah? And the finance ministry noticed that this is nonsense when they were building their own new computing center and wanted to use the waste heat, yeah? <laughs> but these things 
unfortunately requires some governmental flexibility, which I think is contradicting in, in the world itself. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes, so, you know, I'm curious, like whenever people compare energy efficiency against top 500, I think that's the wrong metric because most of the top 500 are like national owned labs. They have no incentive for, and you know, Oak has little incentive for uh, saving on power. I wonder, like, do you have enough data to compare against data centers operated by companies? Because that's where the real incentive is, like, like Facebook, Azure data centers, they all must be optimizing on power consumption. So there's, there's two things. First of all, these centers don't want to give you their numbers because it's a, a, a kind of a trade secret. Uh, they say, if you know how much we're using, then you know what we're doing, which is nonsense yeah? to a certain aspect. Yeah? So you don't get these numbers. The other thing is, with one difference here with HPC compared to all the cloud centers, it's the utilization. They have a very flat curve in terms of utilization. Yeah, so they want to be between 90, maybe 95 percent around utilization. The system we have here is for a different intention. It's not meant to be full or, or highly utilized. It's meant to enable science so that users can use the entire system. So what we have here is if a user comes and requires, like in this case, all 311,000 cores, then that should be possible which also means that we need to empty the system and then kind of have these, this big truck running, yeah? which means our utilization is usually less than what they have. And if you have a, a more constant, uh, higher utilization, your optimizations are, are simpler. You can, can do something, which is what they are doing in a sense to, to make sure that the business model works. And my second question was related to the leaks you mentioned. So I was surprised that, so you had two leaks, but at the back, and none of the leaks on the motherboard. None of the leaks. On the which is surprising. The which you may have said. Which you know, there's water cooling used in, in many other areas or, or water, and I think they have become experts. I mean, the engineers are doing a good job here. I mean, frankly speaking, I was also surprised we didn't have more. Yeah, because the schematic you had, like the tubings were like bound around the motherboard. Yeah. And. I, I, I share your concerns. It's just, it's an observation. This is what you mean, yeah? I mean, one thing you're right, this is, this is again, this is the old board. I think that's the, the 2012 board, maybe, yeah? And you also see optimizations here from the boards from time to time, yeah? But most of the problem is not because you have these, these, these corners in here. Most of the problem is really comes from connectors, yeah? That's where, and the connectors, there's one tricky thing. You need to make sure that this is the same material as the other side, because otherwise you have a reaction between the two materials. That, that, that's one of the things that, that you learn in that sense, yeah? But I'm surprised at you, and I'm saying, oh, we didn't have more. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, one you said you're running the, the clocks at an average of 68%, I think was the average of, of, you know, peak frequency. 60%, 68%, something yeah. like that. So, so I'm wondering, how do you, how do you determine what frequency you know, my job should run at versus Eva's job or someone, you know? Okay, good point. So this is, again, you know, most of these things that you see here are really PhD, the results of PhD thesis. And there was a PhD thesis by Haik Shukurian, who is now working for a company called Bosch. Uh, mm -hmm. That kind of uh, sounds familiar. And what he did was more or less, he, he took the application and ran it with an average clock frequency of 75%. And then he was measuring the memory access. And he said, okay, if, we, if I have a memory access and the processor is busy, there's still a time when the processor is waiting for the memory to be returned, yeah? because memory access takes a long time. Yeah. So if the processor is running slower, this waiting time is reduced. But you get the same results. So the measure we have is energy uh, to science. So how much energy do you need for the result? So you don't want to, to slow down the processor, but you want to make it just to speed enough that the average memory access uh, has uh, as little waiting time as possible. And that's where you can go down with the frequency. The interesting thing, if you take the curve energy to, 
to to solution to to research as we call is it's 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 a U curve. So there's 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 a sweet spot down there, yeah. And that sweet spot is for most of the applications sixty eight percent, which also gives you an idea that we have very uh, we, we have many memory bound applications, yeah. It's different when you go up with compute bound, you would be higher up uh, in a sense. It's interesting you say that. So if you uh, look at the uh, playing with GPUs, and I think most of us got originally interested by the, the floating point performance, right? Yeah. Uh, if I look at the people I know now, it's almost all about the HBM. You know, it's not the floating point performance that matters. And that's why I believe that you can do the same thing with GPUs. I'm convinced you can. Well, this is why I always think you know, you know, Fugaku is my favorite exascale machine, right? Because yeah, it'd be HBM and a normal processor. Yeah. I, I, I think, and, and again, uh, Satoshi did a, a great job with Fugaku. We have a small version of uh, a oh, couple yeah. of notes of, of, of Fugaku just to test it. Mm -hmm. And again, I think I'm following the same philosophy as, as Satoshi. Uh, you need to make these systems for the applications that you're looking at. Yeah. And that is the right system for many applications in science and engineering. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's really unfortunate in the United States everybody's building, you know, the, the public ones are all GPU based, right? So they're you know, very narrow niche of the applications. Yeah, the problem is you cannot like escape it. I was surprised that we got super without any GPUs at that point in time. And as I said, the other offers had all GPUs in there, but our offer was more. We got more than 20% performance out for the application mix that we are asking for. And I, I would even go a step further. Yeah? If, you, if you take away the large language models, which are run at the hyperscalers anyway, yeah? what do we want to do in science? I mean, a large language model for some domain specific input is, is useful. Yeah? Yeah. But I could run that at a hyperscaler. What do we use AI and HPC for? I think it's more, again, that comes to this workflow issue. Yeah? It's more that you would kind of want to have AI as a tool to steer your application, yeah? Like if we're talking about surrogate models, emulators, these kinds of things, yeah? Where AI helps you to, to work on things where our, our mathematical model of physics is either too computationally intensive or not available at all. And here is where, where I think the combination comes, comes, comes to go. And that's why I believe you would need GPUs in there, but not in a sense like you can use all of them for the large language models, but rather you want to use them for steering the HPC application. Yes. Just a, a, a thought on that. Um, in, in my environment now, so you know, in engineering, the people have sort of hierarchies of uh, precision in the modeling versus runtime, right? So, um, if you want a quick answer, you don't care if it's off by a little bit. Yeah, you know, yeah, off. yeah. Um, you know, you can imagine if you're really optimizing the, the, you know, the, the runtime of a human being, the engineer, right? Mm -hmm. so early in the design cycle, I don't need the right answer, I need a quick answer. And so, so that's, a, that's I think, a place where AI is gonna, gonna exactly. grow a lot. Um, but a, another more interesting thing is, so there's a paper, and I can't remember who the academics are, but um, you have an algebraic multigrid code, right? When you get to the coarsest grid, you, you say you use Gaussian elimination to solve it. Um, turns out, at least for some models, you can use machine learning to solve the coarse grid. So, so it, it may you know, creep in in other places where you know, kind of get in the, in the middle of that mathematics you're talking about. Um, so I'm curious, what do you, you said you have a, a a cerebra, um, you said we had three quantum computers? Yeah, well, we, we already had the, 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 the procurement for the next two, so I'll talk about three to five. Okay, so, so I'm curious, what are you doing with those things? Well, the idea is that these things kind of accelerate the computation on the HPC system. So what we want to do is more or less, we want to offload those things where the quantum computer is in advantage compared to the HPC system, uh, from the HPC system to the quantum computer, we turn the results back and then again go on with the quantum computer. In essence, it's the same what we do with AI. Yeah? So we want to load some things onto the AI and then come back with the results. And quantum has, on a certain category of applications, an advantage, at least that's what we hope for, and then we get it back. 
So in fact, what we already do is we already had the, I think last year in October, we had the first job from the HPC system being sent to the quantum computer and the results being returned. That was only hello world, but I think that's the, the idea that we are going to. <clears throat> Any final questions? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jeremy.